this past year has had so many sad moments and there's sadness that's, uh, that unfortunately is still to be found continuing with many people are not well. And, and yet in some way we've sort of discovered each other in different places, different parts of the country of the world that we otherwise normally wouldn't have met. Now, this is not a normal way to meet. I'll tell you the truth, I don't have a computer, I only have a phone. So I can only see like two, three people. I, I, and I'm gonna, I guess I'll try to move it around. I've done thousands of these Zooms. I still, I'm not so good with it. So please forgive me. I'll try to, I go on a little tour every now and then. And I want to, I, 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 I'm sure there's a way that I could see a person who's talking. I guess it'll go on to that person. The green, the green will go on to that person. So please forgive me if I'm a little bit clumsy with, with this. Uh, uh, ben was very sweet what he said, but it's not 30 years. That's an old thing that was written up somewhere. It's already close to 42, 43 years that hey. I've had the unbelievable privilege. It has to be updated in Yemen. <laughs> okay. I've had the, uh, my beard is already, my beard is already white and I have, thank God, a lot of grandchildren. And, and, uh, and I, my, my love for people, my love for my fellow Jews and my excitement to talk to you and to, to meet you in this, even though it's a strange way to meet, hasn't gotten any weaker. I, I just look forward to the day that we'll be able to meet together in, in, in a good place, maybe even in, in Jerusalem, that would be nice. Uh, I would say, I'll take you all out to eat and it's on me, but I don't know if I could afford that, but we'll, we'll, we'll get together somehow. We, it could be arranged and we could actually talk in person. So in the meantime, I didn't come here to give speeches, to give lectures. Anybody that wants to hear any of those, there are thousands of them, I'm sure. Uh, ben can tell you where to find them, but they're, they're online or all over. But I, I, I want to hear what's on your minds, and just for a little bit of time to to talk a little bit to share. And I and I beg of you, I beg of you, please, to speak your minds. And nobody should, nobody should, nobody should be shy. And and if I say anything that's in any way, uh, if you feel it in any way that it's harsh or that it's something that you're having a problem with, don't worry about being critical and and. You could yell at me, you could do whatever you want. I don't take it personally, and I don't mean anything personal. It's just a couple of Jews at the end of history waiting to greet Messiah who, uh, who want to schmooze a little bit, who are talking a little bit. So if I can help in any way, let's get started. All right, so I'm going to get started with one of the, uh, with one of the questions that was submitted in advance um, by one of the participants here. And this is recording, so I, I trust that uh, Moshe Nyhaus Again, appreciate uh, you putting all of this together. I see Yol Gabay, the founder of My Jewish Question, also on the line. Uh, so thank both of you for everything you did to make this possible. And uh, so I'm gonna start off with the first question. I think Moshe also put in the chat that people can submit additional questions now. So Moshe will highlight for me uh, which ones you know, we, you know, we could get to and help, help uh, make the order. But I'm gonna start with one question we got in advance, which is this. Um, uh, somebody here asked, when my family and I met with an Orthodox rabbi and his wife, I noticed that the rabbi shook my hand and not my wife's, and the Rabbitson shook, or not his wife, shook my, my wife's hand, but not my own. What's the big deal about men and women shaking hands? Isn't a handshake just a handshake? Yeah. Um, you know, that question, it's a great question. Uh, isn't the handshake just a handshake? You know, that would have been, if that question would have been asked even three or four or five years ago, I think that it, it, would, have, it would have been a different response. But I think in America here, we've already learned that a handshake is not always just a handshake and that there, that there are boundaries that, are, that are, are, are not kept carefully. And some of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, most powerful people here in the state of New York, one of the most powerful people in the country right now, is suffering from something that a few years ago wouldn't have even raised an eyebrow as far as crossing boundaries. So the Torah and our sages had unbelievable foresight and understood human nature. And they know that for the most part, a handshake is something which is completely, completely innocent. They know that. But they also know that there are circumstances, there are conditions, especially in a workplace, especially when a woman is with a, 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 is in the presence of a man who could be manipulative or controlling, sometimes vice versa, but particularly when a woman is 
in, a, in the presence of a manipulative person, like what's happening right now in New York State, this whole this whole conversation over the governor, um, where where even the slightest uh, even the slightest um, sign of physical of physical contact or intimacy is for that uh, individual who's the predator uh, that that could be uh, um, that could be a, an, an entrance into very very uh, dangerous territory dangerous waters so our rabbis decided the following even though it's true according to jewish law there are many rabbis by the way that say that according to jewish law if it's completely non-affectionate if it's just a business-like shake of the hand there are those who there are those who say that under those circumstances it's not ideal but under those circumstances it's okay you certainly don't want to insult the woman or to insult the man we don't want anybody to be insulted and Therefore, many rabbis, according to Jewish law, permit that in a, in, a, in a formal type of a business setting. They permit it. Um, most other rabbis, most of the rabbis were weary of that more lenient opinion because it's hard to judge exactly when it comes to these things. For one person, we've learned this over the past few years, that for one person, something could be perceived as completely harmless, and for the other person, it's not. It's a. It's a type of a. It's a type. Of, it's the beginning of some effort to make a uh, to cross over that boundary that leads towards, God forbid, something more serious towards some attempt to uh, attempted seduction. So, therefore, the rabbis felt we have an expression in the Talmud. It's in. It's in Aramaic. It says low plug. Low plug means it's best not to make distinctions. To make a rule across the board. This way, under all circumstances, those boundaries are kept in a healthy way. And we don't, and therefore, even though many, many times it's totally harmless, it's not anything and nobody means anything. And it's not a way of showing any affection. That's why you can hand the change over to the girl in the grocery store, the girl to the guy in the, in, uh, over the counter that can hand the change, even though, the, even though there might be a second, they might touch hands, that's not it. But handshaking in different cultures is not always just a very formal, cold type of a, uh, type of a, an encounter. It could means something else. And I've learned over the years that from the most harmless type of, of interchanges, from the most harmless I have seen, and I've dealt with this, that th there have been some people who ended up regretting things in, in a very, very, in a very deep way. So uh, it's not totally against the law, but it's preferable to keep that distance. But sometimes if there's a situation where one of you would be very hurt or insulted, and the and the circumstances are really businesslike. There are those who permit there are those who permit such a thing. But the rabbi and the rabbitson were doing well by by creating that kind of a uh, of a barrier, because for those people in that position, they have to be very very careful that they should remain rabbinical, and to, not to cross over the lines of behaving in a rabbinical way. I even even when it comes to not not with men and women, even when it comes to the guys. You know, there was a, a, a there was a rabbi in New York that lost his position because he was he would go to the uh, Schwitz. You know what the Schwitz is? How do you say Schwitz? A, a, a uh, you know, steam. I forgot what you called. You know, uh, you call it a Schwitz in Yiddish. It means uh, to go to, like they have uh, a bathhouse. You know, a sauna, right? A sauna. <laughs> thank, thank you for putting. So, and he was, and they were, you know, wearing bathing suits, I guess, or towels. But the rabbi, you know, you're teaching Torah. You're supposed to try to represent something which is holy. You're supposed to be a person to look up to. There's nothing wrong with taking your shritz, you know, with going for to, to a sauna. But you don't go with your congregants to the sauna. So the rabbi and Rebbitzin were, were doing what was absolutely right, according to Jewish law. Under different circumstances, there are perhaps there's some room for leniency. Thank you, Rabbi Weinberger. I, I noticed that... Uh, that uh... I see Sally Simon mentioned on the on the chat she's experienced this this exact situation even involving a handshake that it was you know crossing over a little bit in a way that it shouldn't be not completely innocent. Uh, we'll just ask everybody again if you could please change your names right click on your your own picture or your own or your own icon and change your name to your name and your city and turn on your video so we can we can get And your your volume's a little down. Yeah, now it's now it's your volume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes this yeah, it slips. Mike just gets low. Sorry about that. If everybody could turn their name changed to uh, their name and their city 
leave it, turn your video on so we can see everybody. And uh, and uh, Moshe put in the chat some instructions on how to raise your hand in the chat. So if you could like raise your hand and then we can maybe call on somebody for a live question. If you if you put on the icon to raise your hand, that'll enable Moshe to know when the right time comes to unmute you and we can have a live question later on. In the meantime, I'm gonna to go to the second question uh, from those that have been previously submitted, which is why is Judaism so obsessed with tiny insignificant details? How much matzah do we have to eat? Which spoon did I use for milk and which one for meat? What is the right way to tie my shoelaces? Aren't they missing the bigger picture and uh, calling their nitpicking spirituality? Okay, I think that's also a fantastic, fantastic question. And I think all of us who stop and think about these things feel that sometimes. Um, it's very much connected, by the way, to the last question. And I'll tell you how. To the question about shaking hands. Shaking hands is also a tiny, uh, insignificant little ritual uh, that takes place in a social setting. It's a, it's a ritual. It's very, very insignificant. But something which appears to be just a tiny little ritual, uh, depending upon the parties who are involved and the intentions, takes on tremendous, can take on tremendous, tremendous significance. You know, there are, there are certain codes between a husband and wife. There are certain signs that people who know each other and love each other for for, for a long period of time that, that uh, to other people would seem to be very um, petty or insignificant and they wouldn't even understand what they mean. But for the parties who are, who are sharing that secret, this tiny little gesture has, has galactic significance. That's number one. Number two, as one begins to study Torah more and more, especially when you enter into the depths of the hidden part of Torah, the teachings of mysticism of Kabbalah. And in that place of study, you open up the texts, the ancient texts, and you, and you realize that every tiny, tiny little detail, the same way that when it comes to uh, an exquisite painting by da Vinci, that every tiny little detail on the painting, every tiny detail on the painting affects the entire picture that you're looking at, the entire portrait that you're looking at by that tiny little detail. And in a symphony orchestra, if there's one violin, if there's one chord, if there's one note that's not synchronized with the other musicians, the entire song is, is off. The way that God made the world is such that all of these, what seem to be these nitpicking tiny details are intimate, great, deep, intimate codes and signs of God's love for each and every one of us. And if a person studies them and learns what these codes mean and goes deeply into the codes, then you understand how each one of these is making a connection to God, is making a connection to our families, to other, to other Jews throughout the world. You understand more about it. However, I will back you up on what you said in the question that oftentimes what happens is that many of our, many of our co-religionists get completely caught up in the trees and they lose sight of the forest. And Ben is over here and he knows that for all of these years, I'm screaming and kicking and fighting and yelling about this problem that of, of it's wonderful. We should keep all of the laws, but those laws were not meant to, to take away from the romance of our relationship with God. And oftentimes it does. That doesn't mean that one should stop keeping those laws. It means that they need to be kept in perspective. And keeping them in perspective, number one, understanding their significance, their deeper meaning, their symbolism, what they are, that's number one. And number two, not allowing those tiny little details to take over one's, one's, um, one's religion, one's commitment to God, to take over in such a way where there's no longer any emotion, there's no longer any feeling, there's no longer any connection. It's just empty, empty um, nitpicking rituals. They themselves, the rituals are not empty. They have tremendous significance. But when a person 
uses those as an excuse to avoid making eye contact with the creator. And instead of making that eye contact, instead of it being something which is deep and significant and real in your life, all you do is you spend around your whole, you spend, I, I went into a, I spoke in a, in a uh, very beautiful shul in a beautiful synagogue a few years ago. I was invited to speak out of town. And they just told me, they told me that they spent <clears throat> 14 million, 14 million dollars on fixing up the shul. So I said to the people over there, that was the way I, I began this, this speech, as I said, you know, you spent 14 minutes, million dollars to build this beautiful place. I really hope you're davening in it. I really hope you're praying. I really hope you're using it well, because a lot of Judaism has become beautiful buildings and the rituals have become emptied of feeling and emotion. That's not what God intended. When he gave us the Torah on Mount Sinai, it was with fire, it was with lightning, it was with love. He was, it was face to face, it was heart to heart. It wasn't a bunch of laws that, that, that are just an excuse for a relationship. You have that oftentimes in a family as well, that the parents and the children, husbands and wives, that it's become a life of just uh, chores, carpools. Um, I remember there was a, there's an old Paul Simon, I don't know if you ever heard of Simon and Garfunkel, I know this might be, yeah, I, think, I think they're timeless. By this point, they're already timeless. So, so Paul Simon has lyrics in the song that says, I know a woman who became a wife. Those were the very words she used to describe her life. A woman who became a wife. What does that mean? It means she married, she wanted to be more of a woman with her husband, to, that that should develop in, in, in her, 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 her uh, femininity, should develop her being a woman. But somehow over the years, she's become a wife. Now there's no dishonor in being a wife, but she is moaning, she's mourning the loss of her womanhood. She's become a wife, maybe a mother, but she's not a woman anymore. God did not intend for us to become uh, a bunch of uh, religious practitioners. His intention was for us to have a romantic, deep relationship with him and that these, these details, these rituals would enhance the relationship, would deepen the relationship. It's very hard for you to feel that they're doing that unless you really learn what they mean and you really go into it. But I promise you that if you do that, then you'll realize that there's just unbelievable, unbelievable beauty to it and depth to it, unbelievable beauty and depth to it. Thank you, Rabbi Weinberger. Um, the, uh, I'm gonna go, I think Moshe is gonna look at this new question that came in on the chat. So I'm gonna go to question number three in the meantime while, while, while he reviews that. Uh, and again, ask, you know, will it be wonderful if more people could turn the video on also so we could see we could see everyone's faces, reactions, be a little bit drop more like a like a live crowd. Uh, so I recently experienced my first Friday night meal and was surprised to see that the Kiddush blessing was said over a cup of wine. In many other religions, wine, alcohol is strictly forbidden. How can Judaism believe that something which leads to indulgence? And drunkenness can be considered holy. Okay, good. Uh, we just had our holiday of Purim. And, uh, and that question uh, is asked every year, especially by Purim. God expects us and demands of us self-control. Wine, when taken in proper measure. By the way, I don't drink wine at Kiddush. I use grape juice. I'm not, able, I, I'm not, I'm not comfortable with wine. I never drink alcohol. Just... Uh, as a disclaimer, I want to make it clear that I, I am disgusted by drinking. Drinking is something which I find to be, uh, when it's not in the right measure, which often it's not, I, I find to be something which is, which is unbelievably distasteful. And it's certainly, again, it's found many places in the Talmud. Uh, drunkenness, excessive drinking is criticized as something which is extraordinarily dangerous and against the will of God. However, you're right. When a, when a couple gets married, it's over a cup, of, a cup of wine. When we make kiddush, it's over a cup of wine. When a baby is born and there's a bris, a, a baby boy, at the bris, there's, it's over a cup of wine. Now, there are many reasons for that. I'll tell you one of the deeper reasons, and it'll just for now, hopefully it will help a little bit. According to the Kabbalists, the sin that took place in the Garden of Eden was not an apple. There was no apple in the, in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had grapes, and they, according to the, the Kabbalists, there was wine 
that they had, that they made a lechaim with the snake. They were drinking wine. And, and um, ever since then, all those things that took place at the beginning of time, throughout history, our, our responsibility is to try to refine and to correct those, those ancient uh, mistakes, things that need that Hashem, that God wanted in the world should be lifted up to a higher place. Wine, when it's, when it's in measure in the right way, it says in the verse in Psalms, Yain yisamach lavav enos, that wine, has the ability, when it's a little bit of wine, it has the ability to take an edge off of a person, off of a certain stress, uh, sadness, and to open up a person's heart. But there's no question that our rabbis agree that in those situations where drinking has become uh, a form of recreation and it leads to, it leads to misbehavior and, and ugliness and so on, that's, that's absolutely not what they had in mind. So when we drink, by the Kiddush, those people who have wine, our sages taught, that means that when a person drinks wine, a little bit of wine, secrets begin to come out. Now, if you're a person who, and you contain within you secrets of love of, of God and deep secrets of, of holiness and pureness, then a little bit of wine will bring out those secrets. But if your secret is something which best be kept to yourself, you shouldn't be drinking at all. You should have, you should have a seltzer instead. And make a lechaim over a seltzer. Thank you, Rabbi. We, we have a, a question that came through the chat just now from Shlomi Ben Naim. Uh, I think I think that's a man's name. So I'm going to say he said, "I have been listening to a well-known rabbi for many years. In almost every lecture, he says that breaking Shabbat is worse than murder, and not keeping Shabbat, you basically lose all your Jewish rights. What is your opinion?" My opinion is that you shouldn't listen to that rabbi anymore. I don't know why you've been listening to him for many years. I would recommend that you switch channels and go to hear somebody that's somebody that's speaking the language of 2021 and the, and the Torah that God wants to be revealed to our generation. Uh, a person that breaks Shabbos. Shabbos is a very fa fa foundational part of Judaism. It's true. The Sabbath is very, very important for reasons that we don't have time to go into right now. It's a very, very big part of Judaism. Um, the vast majority of Jews these days who are not observing Shabbos, it's not because they're violating it. It's because they, they, don't, they were not raised with Shabbos, nor do they know what it is. They're not, they're not these, nobody's, nobody's guilty uh, as charged and worthy of being uh, brought to the guillotine for doing something that they don't understand. And even if a person nowadays has learned more about Shabbos and has studied it, we're not living in a society or in a culture where Shabbos is widely respected and, 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 uh, and kept. And that affects all of us. Therefore, this rabbi, I'm, I'm sorry, whoever he is, he should, uh, Hashem should, God should forgive him for saying these things. He should not be speaking about punishments. He should be teaching the people who are listening to him about the beauty of Shabbos, of how unbelievable it is when a Jew tries to do even the tiniest little bit on Shabbos to make Shabbos different than the, than the rest of the week. There's no talk here about punishments, about dying. That's absolutely sick. It's sick to talk about such things publicly. Now, is there any truth to that? No, as I said before, even in the days when we had the temple and we had the great court in Jerusalem, it was just about unheard of that a Jew was ever executed for violation of Shabbos. There were always extenuating circumstances that he did not keep Shabbos. And if that was thousands of years ago, it's a million times more now that people are not breaking Shabbos. They don't really, they don't appreciate it. They don't know what it is. It's not that they're breaking Shabbos. N nobody is, is guilty and, and put to death for, for going against something that, that they don't understand, they don't know about. And even if, and again, even if they were raised and taught about this, and taught about it, it doesn't mean they know the depth of what Shabbos is. That, 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 that is a rabbi that you should not listen to, Shlaimi. Stay away. Turn to a different station. Wrong. Delete. Thank you, Rabbi. 
Bina Yochavet wrote just a few minutes ago in the uh, in the chat. I work in the field of veterinary medicine. I know, and I know that some Orthodox Jews don't approve of pets in the home. I'd love to hear your opinion on this, even though I know it seems like a silly question. No, it's not silly. It's not silly at all. I'm asked that question very often. Look, this is not, a, we're not talking here about a, 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 a sin. You understand? I want to make that clear. It's not a sinful to have a pet. Unless like you like to have an alligator in your living room. It's not sinful to have a pet. There are a number of concerns. Let, let me go through one or two of them. The first concern is that a Jewish home is supposed to be hospitable and welcoming. And you might think that your pit bull is very friendly and you love it and you like to cuddle up with it and so on and sit by the fireplace and, uh, and, and play cards together. But there are a lot of people who are going to come into your house and they're terrified of that dog. They're absolutely terrified. Therefore, I've seen this very often. I personally am not comfortable with dogs. I was, my parents are Holocaust survivors. My parents were traumatized by German shepherds in Auschwitz and in Mauthausen. I was raised in terror of dogs. I'm just telling you, that's how I was raised. To my parents, dogs were the embodiment of evil and brought back triggered memories of Nazis and dogs attack that were set to attack Jews as they were getting off the cattle car in concentration camp. So I have a natural, a natural, um, um, feeling of tremendous uh, distance and fear from a man's best friend. They were never my best friend at all. And I was raised to be very, very careful. Now, I understand and appreciate that a person likes that um, company. And uh, I know there's animal therapy, Horace dog therapy. And I understand that with many children, that it does, it, it can be very, very helpful. And, and I, I, I respect that. I appreciate that. But I have found that over the years that I will walk into a house and I will have a huge dog come licking me and sniff, sniffing at me. And I don't like that. And I don't think that it's right from, I don't think that it's right for a, a, a visitor to be, to be uh, in any way frightened or intimidated just because you feel, oh, this dog wouldn't hurt anybody. This dog never hurt anybody. That's, that's fine for you. But, but that might not be the, the most hospitable way to open up your house to somebody. So that's one thing. That's one thing that, but a dog that is, that, that could be um, scary, an animal that could be scary. That's not, that's not, uh, that's not the trademark of Jewish hospitality in a house. Even though the owner always feels that my dog is, my dog is the best dog in the world. My dog is so friendly and so kind and so on. My, my, uh, my son was just reading to me last week from a newspaper about how many friendly dogs in the United States cause deaths of children, babies, and even adults in one year. You wouldn't believe that there are thousands of deaths that take place by through pets, pet dogs, thousands of deaths. So if somebody has, um, if somebody has uh, a fish tank, if somebody has something that's, that doesn't intrude upon another person's feeling of safety or well-being, uh, not everybody likes to have a cat crawling around their ankles, also sniffing and coming around. The owner is convinced that my cat is a tzaddik, is a righteous and holy saint, is a transmigration of Rabbi Akiva, and my cat is so beautiful. How can anybody not be absolutely in love with my cat? I, I kiss my cat, I hug my cat, my cat, my cat eats with me at the table. I, I would have things to say about that type of behavior, but it's not for this, for this uh uh, Zoom right now, but I'm not. I'm not judging those people at all. All I'm saying is that not everybody feels that way. I'm sorry to tell all the pet lovers. Not everybody feels that way. So if it's a so if it's a pet that is not intrusive, that doesn't bother other people, that doesn't threaten other people, the Torah is not against that. There is another issue that when you're making blessings according to Jewish law, if your if your hands are scratching a dog or a cat, an animal, and there's a, there could be a problem with the hands being unclean when it comes to making a blessing or saying Shema and so on. There are a number, there are, that's another issue. That's another issue. But uh, it, I would say intrinsically, there's, no, there's nothing wrong. It's just, does that dog belong in the same room where people are praying, where people are, are, are studying Torah? So there were, there were many, many Kabbalists that felt that an impure animal does not belong. An impure animal, as much as as much affection as you have for this animal, an impure animal does not belong in the same room where Jews are praying, where people are studying Torah. 
but there's nothing there's nothing essentially wrong if you if you keep it away a little bit and you enjoy having the company of, of a pet if it's not a threat or bother to other people there's nothing essentially wrong with that thank you rabbi i'm gonna ask uh, if we could have a few more people also putting the video on putting your names in we'd love to see a, a little more how many how many here. people are on here it's 47 total oh okay right now. 47 total uh, but mm -hmm. many many you know, we don't have the camera on, so we just can't we can't see them. But right. Uh, so okay, I'm going to ask another question here. It was submitted beforehand. Um, I think it seems like a woman asking this question. She writes, "I have been seriously hurt by my ex. It has now been seven months of abuse, put downs, bad mouthing, and humiliation, and I have remained silent. But now I have an overwhelming urge to take revenge." And I have the chance. With one phone call, I could ruin his career and shatter his entire life. Should I do it? Wow. Wow. Aye, aye, aye. First of all, I hope there's some um, legal way to put an end to this abuse that you're suffering. And that, and that um, you'll be able to to finally have some peace from this uh, from this person. That's the first thing. The question is seeking such revenge and potentially destroying this person's life. As sweet as that revenge would be, um, it's not it's not um, generally promoted as uh, an ideal type of behavior. However, I will tell you that our sages taught that when a person is enraged, when a person is abused, that he's not held accountable for acting in ways that are atypical of how he or she would normally behave. That doesn't mean to kill somebody. And, and, I, and it's not, I, I, can't, uh, I can't say anything by way of Jewish law if I don't know all the details of the situation. But I would say, this, I would say the following to whoever you are. I would say, you're probably a long-suffering, exceptionally wonderful and noble person. And when a wonderful, noble person engages in such behavior of revenge, even if it for a moment or for a day or two feels exciting and sweet, and there's some satisfaction that comes with that, if you're a truly deep, ethical, moral, upstanding person, in the long run, that's not something that's going to add to your life. It's not a matter of not destroying his life, whether he des deserves for his life to be destroyed. I would leave that up to the creator of the world to, dis to, to take him out of his job. I would leave that up to the creator to decide how he should be judged. But it would be lowering yourself. It would be, it would be, it would be something that's undignified for a person of your stature to stoop to the, to the behavior of this ex of yours and to yourself become somebody that engages in this type of warfare. My father, may he rest in peace, his way was always to try to take the high road. And I have found in life that there have been many times that there were people who have done things to hurt me. And, and I, I was very tempted to, uh, I was very tempted to get back and I had ways of getting back. But I, I always hear my father saying to me, Maisha, don't, it's, it's only going to make you into one of them. Don't become one of them. Just take the high road. God, God runs the world. And if that person is not punished in this world for what he's done to you, I'm saying this to you, to this woman, if then then he'll be taken care of in other ways by the master of the world. Don't don't take that into your own hands because it's not becoming for you. It's just not becoming. You're not that kind of a person and don't become that kind of a person. Then if you do that, then the abuse is continuing because now he has made you into a person that's vengeful. You know, we're, we're about to celebrate Passover, Pesach. And, and in the Haggadah, one of the things that we read about our exile in Egypt was Vayareu Osanu. It means that they did evil to us. But what, the Egyptians did evil to the Jewish slaves. But one of the interpretations is that the worst thing they did to us is they made us into people who were less sensitive to evil. Vayareu Osanu. They made us people who were less sensitive to evil, to Ra. So if you take revenge, it might give you some satisfaction, but he will have succeeded into making you into a person that you're not. And that's how the abuse continues. And it continues and continues. 
leave it in God's hands. It'll it'll be it'll be much better off. You'll be a much happier person long long term. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, I'm going to call on Sue now to ask a question, and Moshe is going to open up the mic. Sue from Georgia. Well, visiting my son in Georgia. Yes. Okay. Hi. Hi. Kristen had a message on there that she doesn't know how to turn the camera on. Uh, Moshe, if you could help with the uh, camera question. Yeah, so we just on, on the corner, you'll see you have a mute button next to them's video. I that, found that's it. But she, I saw that in the message. So there's people that you want to be on there. And it's just, she's on her phone. Oh, okay. So you should see a function on the bottom. But Subia, you have a question for the rabbi or you just, that was the point you wanted to make? That's the point I wanted to make. Okay. So <laughs> to come on. Thank no, you. I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying this. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Nice. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank Enjoy you. your stay over there. <laughs> Atlanta is a beautiful city, four hours from my hometown of Nashville. The, uh, I'm going to go to another question that was, that was submitted beforehand. Is, uh, somebody wrote this. I have several addictions. I don't want to go through all of them here, but the point is I've been struggling getting off and then back on, going for therapy, getting my life together and then watching it crumble again through the thick haze of my self-abuse. And this has been going on now for some 20 years. I don't see it going anywhere. I made a decision at one point to try to be a good Jew. It's fill-in, Shabbat, kosher, the whole bit. Sometimes I manage to do that. Sometimes I crash and it falls apart. Sometimes I just stay in bed for weeks, afraid of what I might do if I get out. So what has it all helped me? Whatever I do, I remain a miserable sinner, sometimes more miserable, sometimes less. But what does God want with sinners like me? What did he put such a louse of a creature here for? I just want to know, does he appreciate all the efforts I put in trying not to be what I am? I, I don't know how to respond to this without crying. I don't, I don't know who you are, but don't you ever use words like that about yourself to talk about yourself in such a way. If you're in this world, it means that God wants you to be in this world every second. And that means that every tiny, for a person like yourself who has struggled with addictions, who I view as the most heroic people in my life, because every step, tiny little baby step that you make to get out of bed and to get moving and to keep one second of Shabbat, of Shabbos, to try to do one holy act, to try to stay away for one second from that which is wrong in, a, in God's eyes, that's, that's the most unbelievable, cataclysmic, earth-shattering and holy thing. It's the most unbelievable thing. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Look, th this, this is a very painful question. You're a lot of pain. And I can't help you in this kind of a, of a, of a, of a venue. It's not possible. Let me teach you something something from our Torah, and maybe this will help you. In the Torah, there's there's a um, there's a complicated law that has to do with a woman who's suspected of being unfaithful to her husband, and the Torah tells us that that um, she's accused of being unfaithful. Now, this is a woman that that was warned not to go alone with this man, and not to not to and not to, uh, to be careful not to, to fraternize with this person anymore. And she went ahead and she did it. Again, it's complicated, I'm not going into all the details, but I want to tell you one thing, what's fascinating about this. According to, according, according to the law, if, if in the end she is innocent, is determined that she's innocent, and there's a test to find out, it's not important to find out what that is. If she's innocent, God blesses her with all kinds of wonderful things in her life, without going into it. She's blessed with all kinds of fantastic things. One of the great rabbis asked, why is she to be blessed? After all, she did ignore the warnings and she was alone with that man. And she did go into a place that seemed to be uh, for the purpose of having relations with this individual. So why, if she turns out to be innocent, why is she, why is she blessed? So one of the great rabbis taught an amazing thing. He said, could you imagine she ignored all the warnings. The witnesses that came and told her, you are not allowed to do this. 
and, and she went alone with this man who she's probably crazy in love with and is dying to be together with. And at the last moment, she said, I can't do this. I'm not going to do this. I won't do it. And because of that, she's blessed with the greatest blessings of the Torah. Now, you could ask a question. Listen, this is not exactly a righteous woman, you know, based upon what she's doing. What's so righteous about this that God blesses her in such a way? And the answer is, and I want you to hear this. Because when a person is suffering with addictions, temptations, with, with all kinds of things in life that he didn't want and he doesn't want, but he's being pulled and pulled and pulled year after year, and he makes an effort in that situation that he's in to stay away for a minute. Like this woman, she said to this guy, I got to get out of here. I'm not doing this with you. Today, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do it. One second that a person turns the computer away from that bad thing, one second that a person even a second for a person who's in that fight and that war is like, is like the rest of us putting on film every day of our lives. You hear this? It's like me putting on film every day of my life. When you, for one minute, you pull yourself and you get up out of bed and you put on film, it's like me doing it my whole life. That's how precious it is, Tasha. You're not a louse. You're not a sinner. You're a fighter. You're a fighter. Many people in your situation would have taken their own lives, God forbid, God forbid. Many people in their own lives wouldn't be asking questions and trying and struggling. You are a heroic fighter. You did not put yourself into this situation. The circumstances are from the beginning of time that you had to go through this in life. And your responsibility now is not to put on film every day, not to be the holiest rabbi. Your responsibility is try to get yourself out of bed and try to do the best you can. And even if you fall again and again and again, you pick yourself up, you wipe yourself off, you dust yourself off, and you move, you try to go forward. And if you do that for the rest of your life, when it comes time at 120 and you go to the next world, you are going to be welcomed by the angels as being one of the greatest heroes of our generation. I promise you. Thank you. I uh, wanted to sa save some of these heavier questions for after we got uh, warmed up a little bit. Uh, so we have another one here. Um, after our daughter was born, my husband and I didn't have children for many years. Then we were finally blessed with a beautiful boy. I had big plans for him. He was going to be a doctor, maybe a lawyer. He was going to marry a lovely Jewish girl and give me many beautiful grandchildren. Well, my plan is not working out. My son, now five years old, was diagnosed with severe autism a year ago. He's five years old and nonverbal. He cannot dress himself. He uses diapers around the clock. He cannot communicate with signs or pictures as it is all too complicated for him. He communicates by screaming or crying or kicking or grabbing what he wants. I am infinitely sad. He will never get married and have children, let alone be a doctor or a lawyer. My dream of having nachat pride for my son is shattered. Do you have any wisdom to share with this broken and exhausted mother? I don't know about wisdom. I could share with you a broken heart at hearing about your, your shattered dreams, your disappointment. That soul that was sent to you, that was in your womb, that you brought into the world, that soul had your name and your husband's name written on it at the beginning of time. And it was not a mistake. It was sent to your address because the, the one who created us knows that the only one on earth who will be able to get over her disappointments and shattered dreams and to shower this, this child with infinite love is you, nobody else, only you. Your name was written on the soul. That's a responsibility that none of us pray for and none of us expect, none of us. But this is exactly, this is exactly what was prepared for you. And that means that God has given you the strength and the ability to recalibrate and to reset 
and to look at this child and to raise this child and to have, I know it's going to sound strange, tremendous nachat, tremendous, tremendous love and pride. Tremendous love and pride. But my dear friend, as long as you're dwelling upon the disappointment of what could have been and what you were hoping would be, I'm afraid that you're not going to be able to appreciate the loveliness of this child. I'm afraid you're not going to appreciate the holiness that this child brings out in you. Because the holiest people that I have met in my life are the ones that have special children. Again, I don't wish it upon anybody. But those people that I know who have, have been able to get past that first stage, sometimes it takes years to get that past that first stage of horrible disappointment and the immensity of the responsibility, that feeling that's overwhelming, those who get past that are filled with pride. Are, I know I have congregants, I have students, I have friends who are, who are filled with pride, who are able to see in this child, not only the innocence of pure love, but to give a type of love to this child, to bring out within you a reservoir, to draw from a reservoir of love that you would not have ever, ever drawn from with your doctor of a son, with your doctor or your uh, lawyer of a son. You wouldn't have found the reservoir of love within yourself and with your husband. So I, I want to bless you, that you and your husband, should, this should deepen your relationship. And that this child, you should see that this child is a blessing, not a curse. This child is a very, very great blessing to you and to your husband. And you will be able to have years and years and years of pride and joy. Just you have to let go of that, of that disappointment. How to do that's not for, uh, I have no words of wisdom for that now. That's a conversation for a different type of a conversation. It's not for in public. But, but as soon as you let go of that, as soon as you let go of that, and you're able to see this child as one of the pure souls that is not marred by, by the ugliness of this world, that is pure and unstained by the ugliness of the world that we live in, you'll be able to have immense nacha. You'll have tremendous pride. And you will be also proud of yourself because you will be one of those people that, that took care of one of these children that God wanted to send into the world before Messiah comes. And I'll tell you something else, my friend, that once Messiah does come and this world was, is going to be, this world is going to be perfected, then your child will be perfectly well. I don't know if he's going to decide at that point to be a lawyer or a doctor. I don't know. And by the way, that's not necessarily the sign of perfection. I know, I know a lot of messed up doctors and lawyers, but your child will then be healthy, communicating, and that child will say to you, mommy, I know everything that you did for me. I, was, I know every smile, I know every tear, I know every single thing that you gave up to take care of me. And that day, who's going to have bigger nachas than you? The mothers of the doctors or lawyers? No. You're going to have the biggest nachas in the world. It's going to be soon, with God's help. You'll see. Oh, thank you, Rabbi. Um, we have another question that was submitted before. I have a jealousy problem. I am envious of anyone who succeeds more than me or has more than I do. It makes me miserable, but I just can't get rid of this emotion. What can I do to feel differently? The Bible tells us that jealousy is something that causes the, a person's bones to rot. What that means is it eats away at a person. Jealousy eats away at a person. The problem with the jealous person is that um, instead of focusing on himself, he's measuring himself vis-a-vis -vis others. That means that if you're jealous of others, unfortunately, you're not focused on what you should be doing to improve your own life. You're measuring yourself by others. That could be for many reasons I don't know you. It could be that you were judged a certain way when you were growing up in a way that was not generous, in a way that was not loving. It could be that you've been through certain things in life that have caused you to be, to feel that, uh, that, um, uh, that, other, that, that another person's success is somehow uh, at your expense. The only, way, the only way to overcome this most um, painful 
emotion of jealousy is that when you see somebody that the rabbis teach us that when you see somebody that you're jealous of, I'm going. This might sound silly to you. Try it. Daven for that person. Pray for that person's success. It seems counterintuitive because here, the last thing in the world you want is that person to be successful. You feel that it's cutting into your life. You're not as successful as that person. You, if you start to pray for that person's success, at the same time recognizing that whatever, whatever blessings you have in life, to be grateful for it, to be thankful to God and pray to Hashem, to God, thanking you for all your blessings, and you pray for that other person to be successful and to ask God for help, that that person's success should be something that doesn't hurt you at all, you'll find that over time by praying for the other person you're jealous of, that you begin to feel more empathy and you begin to see more of that person's difficulties and challenges as well. It sounds silly, it works. Not after a day or two. Try it, a week, two, three. Pray for those people. And you'll see, you'll begin to empathize with them. You'll begin to recognize them, not as individuals who are a threat to you, not as individuals who are challenging you, or in some way make you feel bad about yourself, but other human beings, brothers and sisters who are going through what they're going through just like you, and you will have empathy and love for them instead of jealousy. Try. Thank you, Rabbi. I think we have question, a time for about one more question, uh, which I'm going to read now. Uh, I have been in the hospital for 33 days and was just discharged yesterday, a rare neurological disorder. I said Shema twice, and one morning asked God, asked Hashem, if he needs me, uh, if he still needs me, I think meaning alive, then to end my suffering. Much of the suffering is the disease, and much of it is because of medical people who pretend to know my condition, but don't, even the experts. The abject suffering and trauma is deep, deep, and beyond painful. Days I was being denied breathing assistance for no reason, as doctors watched me literally suffocating. I'm not suicidal, but some days I want to be discharged. I wanted to be discharged just to die at home rather than under the so-called care of mortal man. I'm in my 40s and this hit me at 30. I used to run and be active and joyful and now it's hard being crippled and abused by the system so lauded by most. What does God want of my purpose? I used to teach youth and adults and now I struggle with basic life skills. Medications are sometimes effective and sometimes not. I don't want to die at a hospital. What is the answer by the Torah? Look, the, 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 the question of why is it that good people suffer? I mean, I have been speaking about that a little bit over the course of this hour, but why is it that, that a person like yourself, so productive, a teacher, alive and vibrant and so on, has, has been um, diminished in such a way? It really goes back to what I was saying to the to the wonderful mother of the autistic child five minutes ago. There was a great rabbi that I knew. He died, it's already, it must be already 25 years ago. His name was Rab, Rabbi Aaron Soloveitchik. He was a great genius, a descendant of great rabbis. And he suffered a terrible stroke. In the prime of his life of teaching, he was a teacher of thousands of students and he suffered a terrible stroke. He was a master of Talmud. His son-in-law told me once that he came into the hospital room or the rehab and his, and his father-in-law was studying was reading a very, very simple section of the Bible, of the Torah. One that a person of his level would normally be like embarrassed to be caught studying. It was so elementary and basic. And he couldn't help himself. The son-in-law said to his father, the great rabbi, he said, <clears throat> this is what you're studying. So his answer was, when I was fully myself, when I was healthy and well, and I was a scholar, and some considered me, many considered me to be a Talmudic genius, 
And that's what God wanted of me at that time. Now that I've suffered this stroke, I can barely read. I can barely look at a page for more than two or three minutes. And that's what God wants of me right now. That's what God wants of me right now. What, what could I do? If I would have your name, I would daven for you. I would pray for you. All of us could daven for you together. All of us will daven for you. We'll get your name. That you should be able to be back on your feet and that this disorder should be resolved. And that, and that these people who are posing as doctors but who are not helping you, that they should be replaced by true messengers of God. There are some wonderful doctors and by true messengers of God who will, who will be sent by God to relieve you of this terrible suffering that you're going through. But for the moment if, that you're in right now, the Torah's view is, this is exactly what God wants you to do right now. Not to teach, not to do what you were doing before, but to do what you're doing now, which is under the circumstances, whatever is the best you could do. Whether it's making phone calls to people who could use a kind word, whether it's thinking with your imagination of things that you could do, to distract yourself from your own suffering by doing kind things with your limitations to help other people. You know, some of the most effective teachers, by the way, of those who are people who have suffered. I know many people in recovery, people with addictions who are in recovery, that they go around the country helping kids and adults who are going through addictions and so on. So too with you. You're with God's help, you're going to recover and you're going to help others who are suffering. Prepare now. Start now, talking to others, teaching others. You're still a teacher. See what you could do to give of yourself to others while you're in this situation. Don't wallow in the anger towards the doctor. Get good doctors, but don't wallow in that anger. Don't wallow in, 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 in misery and, and pain. As terrible as it is, stay focused on the good that you could do in your present situation. You're limited, just like that great rabbi. You're limited. You're not the... You're not the uh, healthy, vibrant person that you were, but even in the situation that you're in, you can give life to a lot of people. You could still be a teacher. You could still do a lot of great things. And I want to give you a blessing on behalf of all of us that you should be strong, healthy, and well, and do great things, great things with your life. Thank you, Rabbi. I believe that we are, we are out of time, but I want to remind everybody that they can Continue to learn more uh, from Rabbi Weinberger. First of all, subscribe on social media or by the email on, on the My Jewish Question website uh, to continue to hear more. And uh, also, you can go to uh, a website called yutorah.org. That's the letter Y, the letter U, like Yeshiva University, yutorah.org. Uh, there's over 5,000 lectures from Rabbi Weinberger on all different topics available there uh, by MP3. Uh, and you can listen to those live streaming, download, whatever. Um, and uh, so that's uh, so that's it. Moshe, anybody else? Rabbi Weinberger, am I missing anything? No, just I, 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 I repeat what I said at the beginning. I really look forward to, to, to meeting you all in person. And we should be able to hang out a little, a little bit together in Jerusalem and good health, all of us together. All of us together, whoever is suffering, no more. Get out of bed. Come to Jerusalem. And let's let's have uh, some pita and falafel together. Amen. And on Pesach, on Pesach matzah. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi. Okay, everybody should be well. Have a happy Pesach. Have a good Yom everybody. Thank you.